I came across a very touching story in writing Effortless, and it didn't make it into the final book. Uh, but it's sort of my one regret that it didn't. Um, it was a story of a mother who was with her dying son, the end of his life, uh, in the hospital, and she knows it's the end. She knows this is it. Um, because there is a time sometimes, and I've had it, I've been with people in this moment where they're not fully here still, but they're not fully there yet. Mm. And it's in that in between. And in the in between, he, he suddenly opens his eyes and he, he says to his mother, it's all so simple. Mom, it's all so simple. And those were his last words that he died. And from that, I think we can draw one final question for today's conversation, which is just to ask, how am I making, how am I making life more, how am I making life harder than it needs to be? Hey, Insider, we have a special interview for you today featuring a world-renowned author, Greg McEwen, who is best known for his New York Times bestselling book, Essentialism and Effortless. Greg has dedicated his career to discovering why some people break through to the next level and others don't. And his clients include Adobe, Apple, Google, Facebook, Pixar, and Twitter, to name a few. And he's been interviewed on numerous television and radio shows, including NBC, Fox, and as a regular guest on The Steve Harvey Show. So if you're wanting to discover how to stop being constantly overwhelmed, stressed, overworked, and feeling burned out in your life, so you can finally take charge and feel great once again, then this episode is specifically made for you. So be sure to pay close attention to all of the golden nuggets that's literally spread throughout this interview, especially towards the end, as you'll find it truly practical for your own personal life. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy this special interview episode. I was curious to know, why do you believe sometimes people tend to make their heart, life harder than it needs to be? Why not make it more simple? Uh, I mean, we could answer that in a lot of ways, but one one way is because of something called the paradox of success, which is that when you have simplicity and focus, it is so powerful, uh, it generates success. It's catalytic. Uh, it's not just a nice to have, it drives success in surprising ways. And then what comes with success, uh, excuse me, is options and opportunities. And those options and opportunities, um, you know, that's just code for increased complexity. Mm. And so if we don't change the systems of our lives and don't change our mindsets and skill sets, then those increased options and opportunities actually undermine the clarity and simplicity that led to success in the first place. And so it creates a, you know, this paradox of success. And it's a paradox because success can become a catalyst for failure. Mm. And so especially if it leads to what Jim Collins has called the undisciplined pursuit of more. And right now, my perception at least is that to live in the developed world is to live within a culture of the undisciplined pursuit of more, or what I sometimes call the non-essentialist culture. Uh, and that just is an outgrowth of success. It doesn't, even if an individual doesn't feel very successful and, and hopefully people watching and listening to this do, but even if they don't because they're comparing themselves against some other ideal, if you compare it against the, anything like the history of the world, they have so many more options and opportunities than, you know, let's say pre the industrial revolution, uh, that it's almost unthinkable uh, for the majority of the human experience. We have, you know, none of us have had very many options at all because everything has been survival. But then the industrial revolution and the technology revolution behind it has changed that uh, in, in extreme ways. And so we just keep adding and adding and adding new options, new ideas, and, and there's some strength to that. But because we don't have developed the abilities to eliminate and to simplify, because that hasn't been developed at anything like the same speed as which the optionality has increased, it means that we find ourselves stretched too thin at work or at home, busy but not productive, 
uh, feeling like our day is hijacked by other people's agenda for us, and, and often just teetering on the edge of exhaustion or fully into burnout. It's a natural extension of that changing context around us, which has so much option, uh, so many choices uh, that keep us away from the clarity that would help us to actually get to the next level. Mm. So what I'm hearing is as one becomes more successful, more opportunities begin to be laid out on their plate, they begin to take on more and begin to do more. So with this individual, they'll begin to yeah, experience stress and burnout, as you're saying. Where would you say is the perfect first step for them in terms of really being able to get rid of this clutter? What can this individual do to begin to manage this? Well, I could offer a few things, uh, even if it seems appropriate, maybe even just five specific things that people could do uh, to become, to make doing what's essential more effortless. Uh, and, and the first is, is simple and came to me from an entrepreneur uh, based in the UK uh, who started asking themselves one question every morning. What's the most important thing I need to do today? And I would add, if you ask that question, also with a secondary question of why does it matter so much to me uh, and get a little deeper as to the why you value it, it will help give you a clearer intent around your behavior for that day. Uh, for her, she started asking the question, the same question every day, but the answer changes. Uh, the the at first, it was something to do with her business, some key project. Then it became something to do with her health, protecting the asset, let's say it that way. Mm. Uh, and she's the asset. But then there was also, there was also a moment where uh, her dad gave her a phone call and said, oh, your mom's in the hospital again. Uh, there's you know, nothing for you to worry about. It's nothing serious, just letting you know, keeping you in the loop. But that day, she asked the question, uh, same question, but different answer. She knew exactly, clearly, I need to be there. Um, time seemed to stand still for her. She remembers the weather outside, everything. Uh, and so she makes the two-hour trip to the hospital. So she's keep giving up the rest of her day to do this. And she says to her mom when she sees her, look, I'm happy to be here. I love you. Mother says the same back to her. I love you too. Within an hour of that conversation, to everyone's surprise, uh, her mother fell into a coma, uh, and then, you know, within a week, uh, she had the unfortunate job of turning off the life support machine. So the reason I know about that story is because she wrote to me afterwards to say, if I hadn't been an essentialist that day, by asking that question every day, then I would have made a different trade-off, and how different my moment and life would have been because of that. So that's the first thing you can do. Um, the second thing you can do is, is sort of inherent in that first story is, is to learn how to negotiate trade-offs. Because everything in life, and this is really key to the work that I do, is a trade-off. Every time we say yes to one thing, we're not just saying no to something else. We're saying no to 10 or 20 or 100 other things we could be doing. But often we evaluate decisions as if, well, I can, uh, you know, I can, you know, if, is it good? Mm -hmm. If it's a good thing, I say yes, no problem. But we're not conscious of all these other trade-offs. And so we need to learn to, you know, first of all, be aware of the trade-offs and to then negotiate them with ourselves even. The next time you have two things coming at you, Choose one of them instead of just trying to do both. Uh, the next time you're negotiating, even, even with a manager who comes to you and says, oh, I'd like you to do this, uh, see if you can't find a way just to discuss. Say, oh, yes, I'm happy to do this. This is what I'm doing right now. Is this more important? Now, you don't have to do that every time. But if you learn to negotiate trade-offs, uh, then, you, then, then you're going to make a lot of, uh, you're going to be more of an essentialist uh, and fast. Maybe I should pause. Do you want the other three? <laughs> Go for it. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't want a monologue here for you. Um, 
Number three is I would suggest that people create buffer in their life. Uh, I'll suggest that they create two hours of buffer mm. in their everyday experience, broken into half an hour segments. Um, so these are meetings with yourself. Uh, they are blank periods. I learned the practice from Jeff Wiener, who's the former CEO of LinkedIn. He's an essentialist and he takes it pretty seriously. And as a result of it, he said to me, I can only think of one day as CEO that felt frenetic and frantic, uh, which to me is unthinkable. Wow. I mean, for the rest of us, our lives uh, can feel frenetic and frantic regularly. Yeah. And yet he would this enormously fast growing uh, startup in the middle of Silicon Valley didn't feel it. Well, one of the reasons for that was, uh, was this practice. Uh, he, he had it scheduled on his calendar, these four half an hour segments. And you, sometimes he would just use it to catch up on email so that he wasn't just overloaded by that. Sometimes he would use it to think, to plan, sometimes to deal with an emergency that had come up. But he stands distinctive from, the, from what most of us do, which is to, at least in today's vernacular in the pandemic, an eat, sleep, Zoom, repeat life. Yeah. You know, it's just a perpetual flow of meetings with no breaks. So you're often late for the next meeting uh, or you... Uh, you know, you're stressed perpetually because you don't have time to prepare. So number three would be create buffer uh, on the schedule. I would say the fourth thing to do is, is to just get comfortable with the question, what does done look like? Uh, it's, a, it's a really simple question. Uh, and it's, it's, it's almost so simple. You think, well, do you really have to emphasize this? Uh, but actually, I found that you do because many times when people start a task or a project, they have only a vague sense of what done really is. And so as a result, the chance of getting very uh, distracted onto, you know, by well-intended distractions, adding this, you know, feature, this functionality, uh, you know, just overcomplicating something and always making it harder to get to the finish line. Uh, one application of that question is to create a done for the day list uh, so that when you're creating your plan for the day, instead of just having an endless to-do list, uh, which often, uh, often we have, uh, in fact, often our to-do list is longer by the end of the day than it is at the beginning. Uh, in this instance, you say, okay, I'm going to do, I mean, let's say th three things in your personal life, personal and family, and three things in your uh, in your in your business or profession, these are the you know the the highest most important things that you can do. And you're trying to craft a list that says, if I complete these, I will feel satisfied with today. These were the important things. And so when you're done, you can be done, and you can say, okay, uh, I you know that that's a boundary. I can now avoid sneaky work going forward. Uh, so I would say, you know, this question: What does done look like, including? doing that for today's planning session. And, and number five is a new question. It comes from the new book, Effortless, and it's to invert, always invert. That is to, instead of asking a question that most insecure overachievers ask, which is how can I achieve more by doing more, uh, by working even harder, uh, instead to ask the question, how can I accomplish more uh, in, 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 by making it easier? Mm. by making it effortless. Uh, it, it, it runs quite countercultural, in fact, very countercultural, uh, to, to instead of just pushing harder to actually look for easier. Uh, sometimes, sometimes overachievers have built into their minds the idea that, that the only path the only virtuous path is harder and harder work. It's like a Puritan idea. Uh, and, and I do think that working hard is a virtue. Of course I do. Um, and I also think that we shouldn't take it to the point of vice where we distrust the easy. 
is as soon as you do that, you remove all of this, uh, all of these strategic um, paths that would help you to achieve the thing that matters, but without burning yourself out. So I was working with someone in just this situation. She's the, she's the kind of person who's up till 4 a.m. in the morning, photoshopping for a church youth group the next day. There's that, that's not her profession, and no one's asking her to do that. She just thinks, if I want to make a bigger contribution, I have to sleep less. I have to do more. And so I gave her this, you know, this magic question. Uh, and so she gets a call from her uh, professor at the university. She says, oh, I need you to get your team to come and you know, to record my class for the semester. She already... She's ready just to jump in. Yeah. Uh, well, we can get a whole team there for you if you'd like. We could have multiple cameras. Uh, we'll edit it all together, add music. We'll have some graphics, intros, outros, everything. I'm going to wow him. And then she stops the coaching. She remembers, ask her this different question, invert the question. Is there an effortless way, an easier way to achieve what you really want? Well, what do you want? What does done look like? Well, it's for one student who's going to miss a few classes because of an athletic commitment. Oh, well, what's the easiest way to solve that? Maybe we can have someone else in the class just record it on their iPhone and send it to him whenever he's going to miss. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. He's running too fast too. He's distressing the easy. Oh, let's just do that. Great. A 10-minute call solves his problem. And she hangs up the phone and she's like, I just saved four months of work for a whole team. And he's just as happy with the solution as, this, as if I had done that, perhaps even happier. There's less disruption for his world. So that's the power of inverting the question. Those are just five you know, specific things you know, off the top of my head for what people could do right now to make what's essential more effortless in their life. Wow. <laughs> Uh, firstly, yeah, it makes so much sense. It makes so much sense. And in your book, Effortless, I mean, what you explain is really simplifying tasks, processes, and everything in between. And when I was reading it, it just makes so much sense. Why not? Why don't I make it easier? I suppose what <laughs> was running through back of my mind when I was reading the book was, how do you personally remind yourself of these uh, disciplines and these questions, do you incorporate them into your habits? Like, how do you remind yourself of these questions and steps? Mm. Yeah, that, that's a, it's a good question. Uh, and I'm not sure I have, you know, solved this in, in my own world yet. Uh, I, still, I still find myself taking the harder path regularly. Um, so I think that one good trigger is just whenever you're feeling stressed, <laughs> you know, whatever you feel, and that is that happens to me still, you know, multiple times a day. But I think that's a good tr trigger. I'm feeling stressed. Okay, why are you stressed? Is there an easier way to do what you're doing right now? Uh, is there a, is there an alternative to it? And so that would be a. I think that's a trigger that that is a real time trigger. So that it's not something that just once a day you think about. You think about it when you need to think about it. When you feel overwhelmed, you can ask this question. When you feel frustrated. I mean, if you take those three triggers, uh, you're going to have many, many opportunities in the next 24 hours to apply at least this question that we've been talking about. Uh, the, the next time you start a major project, it would be maybe another trigger. It's the, at the beginning of the project, you say, okay, Hold on. Let's just let's just talk through these things. Uh, let's just ask what does done look like. What is the minimum viable completion of this that would be acceptable to everybody? Uh, the, these questions, and and then that the 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 other question that I, I love is is you know how could, how many steps can we remove? Uh, can we do this in one step? That's a question I've asked a lot since writing Effortless and. Um, I, I'm frank to say I've asked it a little out of desperation. Uh, there's been so much increase, again, of demand. Um, it's like I keep creating the very problem I'm writing about. Um, and, and with Effortless, you know, being a New York Times bestseller again, and, and it's, just, it's just driven, and I think partially because of the pandemic and the impact of that on people's lives and sort of timely, 
But I, I think my demand is probably two or three times what it was pre pre pandemic. And so there's a variety of things that that I'm working on. And I, I find myself saying, yeah, this this isn't sustainable. You know, this I can't do this on my own. Uh, and so asking that question, is there a way to do this in one step, mm. uh, like one step delegation? where you give somebody the full responsibility for a project or a task and, and you put the effort in up front to make sure that they're clear on the expectations. You make, it, you make sure you've got the right person in place. Um, the, um, Warren Buffett uses um, three criteria for that. Uh, intelligence, uh, excuse me, first is integrity. Second is intelligence. Third is initiative. I call that the three I's. If I can find people with high, high eyes, right, then, then you can delegate to the point of one, one click where they're doing, at least over time, once you've sort of set it up, you, you're going from doing work yourself completely to work where a single thumbs up, thumbs down is the only involvement. Now, I, I, I won't say the specific projects and work that I'm doing that, that have led to that, that I'm on that level to now, but I have some. And it's quite, it's quite amazing to me. I, I think, well, previously, maybe I spent hours a week doing this. And, and, and now it's literally a single, a single one click solution. Uh, so uh, I feel a little meandering in your answer in answering this question. But these are some of the ways that I I'm trying to remind myself mm -hmm. as I move from uh, from mm -hmm. this old way of thinking yes. to this new way of thinking. Mm, makes sense. So create these trigger points that acts as a cue that's just going to remind you to ask these questions. Earlier, you was talking about buffers, and you was mentioning somebody takes two hours to uh, yeah just just let them be in a, in a way. How can somebody best enforce that into their life? Because I can already see the comments coming through. I mean, who's got time for that? Literally <laughs> two hours in a busy person's day. I mean, what does that take? Because I'm sure you've had this question asked by a busy person before. How can they enforce that? Well, the, what's worked best better in my life is not to just try and do this like today or tomorrow. Mm. Uh, because because we've almost certainly committed that time and maybe committed it two or three times over. So the idea of then just adding one more thing, oh, hey, you know, just find two hours on your schedule tomorrow. It's like, no. Uh, and so I, I accept that. Uh, the, the, the cheapest way to implement that change is to look ahead in your schedule to the point where it isn't committed yet and commit it there on a on a repeated basis so for example one thing that i think is a you know is a is a sort of it's not quite what jeff weiner does but it, it's still like a step in the right direction is just to protect your lunch hour we did actually take a lunch uh, the mm -hmm. person i was coaching before that i was mentioning rather uh, she she felt guilty if she took lunch like even if she ate lunch she felt guilty that's where you can see that this, this work ethic, this hard work ethic has become a vice. I mean, that's, that's just like, to me, it's ridiculous when you hear that. And yet I know she's not alone in that uh, sensation. Um, so, so you say, okay, I'm going to actually schedule the lunch hour on my calendar. I'm going to have it. And then I'm at least then other meetings won't get scheduled over it. It's there. It's, you know, it is protected. Uh, I would encourage people uh, to to at least. I mean, there's so many different circumstances. It can be it can be hard to just apply these things, you know, to make statements that you say, "Oh, everybody can do this." Maybe people can't, but I would encourage people to have a, a done for the day time, uh, and in, in, in addition to a done for the day list, a done for the day, you know, time. Um, there's a there's a a podcaster who was telling who I learned about, uh, who has five thirty as his done for the day uh, time, and he did it for about three years, about seventy five percent of the time. He would leave a meeting at five twenty five, even like right in the middle of the meeting, he'd start packing up, and it became culturally known that this was his norm, so he could be home in his car by five thirty and home by six. Oh. 
I was so impressed by that that I thought, okay, well, I'm going to do it. And at the beginning of the pandemic, I said, well, I'm going to have it because if I don't build this boundary, mm. then there won't be any. You know, at least before the pandemic, there was a commute. Not that that was a great use of time or anything, but there was a physical separation between home and work to some extent. Not yeah. much because of the digital flood that just goes with us everywhere we go, but at least something. Uh, and then with that gone, it was all gone. People didn't even know what time of day it was. It just didn't even what what day it was. Uh, and and it just becomes this endless flow of the same. So having a boundary, I think, is important. And and to recognize that if your reaction really is, oh my goodness, this is impossible. Well, start small. Start with the lunch hour. Or start with ten minutes. It, you know what? Maybe even 10 minutes is, seems too much to someone. We'll start with five. If you don't have five minutes, though you can have a meeting with yourself for five minutes, well, you don't have a life. I mean, that's the unfortunate reality of that. And and it's and I don't say that, I don't say that in a callous way. I was doing a session with a with a group of uh, with hundreds of individuals, in fact. And I asked people there this question. I said, what's something essential that you're underinvesting in? Um, and we had lots of answers coming in. And one of them was time for myself uh, and you know, effectively buffer. And so I had that person come up on camera. And the moment she came, you, know, you could tell uh, she's absolutely exhausted, truly burned out. And um, she has six children at home. Uh, it's in the middle of the pandemic. She's running a business, trying to. And she said, I do not have five minutes to myself right now. And I believe her from the second she's up in the morning to the second she's. So I'm not, when I say start with five minutes, if you don't, you don't have a life. I'm not trying to be callous about that or unfeeling about that. Uh, some people's circumstances have been so enormously hard. Um, and that's, that was part of the trigger for me to write effortless. You don't write a book on effortless because life is easy. There's no point to write it. You write it because it's hard, desperately hard for so many people, so much of the time. And I wondered if I could maybe write something that might make life a little easier. And one of the things that will make life a little easier is to, is to craft out some time, uh, to be able to think. Uh, and if it starts at five minutes, I mean, I said it to her. Well, can you, can you, can you go into a, a room? Can you, can, you know, can you, can you do five minutes? And she's like, now that we're talking about it, I've, I realize I can. Of course, I can. Uh, you know, I can do ten minutes. I can talk to them. I, I, I need some time. I'm going to going to do to have a few minutes. And she's like, that is possible. I just haven't been doing it. Why haven't you been doing it? Um, I said, you, um, you are the asset of your life you need to protect that asset you are valuable you are important you are the only the only mechanism through which you can make any other contribution to anyone and if you don't value that and protect that asset there won't be an asset for any of those other contributions it was distinctive and telling the expression in her face it, it was touching to her to, to hear that to be affirmed in that way i'm not saying that to be in any way self-congratulatory just to just to illustrate that for many people who are burned out, uh, which is in a sense, I feel like just about everyone right now, uh, it's so important to recognize you are, you know, you really are the asset that must be protected. You, you really must create this space. And maybe you have to build your way up to anything remotely like two hours. Fine. Start wherever you are. And, and, and build it because the more space you create, the more aware you'll be of the false economy of just trying to, of never having space to think or to, to respond or to in any way get ahead. Uh, you, you will find it, I think, in a, in a, in a sort of positively addicting uh, to, to suddenly go, oh, I have some space. Oh my goodness. Why didn't I do this sooner? Oh, well, let's, let's try and build out half an hour? What can I do to change my systems? What can I negotiate so I can put breaks in my schedule to be able to pause and to think throughout the day? Yeah, makes sense. Even if it's for five minutes, turn it into a habit, 
eventually look to expand that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I was curious to know in terms of your personal habits, Greg, uh, let's start with, cause we've got, uh, subscribers who are a big fan of morning evening routines. It's kind of like a trend to let's say nowadays, <laughs> what, what are some of your morning habits that really keep you, uh, being able to live as an essentialist and focus and so forth? Yeah. Um, you know, some of the things that are, uh, are routine for me, uh, would, would be, I mean, I, I certainly want to get into a journal. Uh, I I've kept a journal. I don't think I've missed a day in about maybe the last 10 and a half years. Maybe I don't think I've missed a day. Uh, I, I use it in a whole variety of ways. Uh, one of them is I use it as my planning tool. So it's where I'm actually doing the work we've talked about before. What's essential today and why does that matter? Um, I'm just making, I am making a list, but I'm also prioritizing it and selecting, okay, which things, if I got them done, I'd be satisfied in. Uh, I mean, I take time as early as I can to, to read. I mean, for me, it's scripture, but I'd recommend any, you know, whatever wisdom literature, some, you know, the highest source of a wisdom inspiration that somebody can access and somebody's ever come across. Um, I, I've, I, I, for six months, I did perhaps um, at least half an hour of that, uh, maybe, maybe more, maybe close to an hour for most of that time. I'm not doing that now. It was a particular challenge that I'd set myself, but my goodness, how, how I noticed the, the difference uh, when I did that. And I I've missed it in the sort of few months since I've been doing that. I still do some every day, but, but it, it, it's a, it's a, it's such a bargain uh, to invest in that kind of reading uh, and that kind of uh, reflection because it can become revelatory rather than just informative, where you start to have insights about your life and about your own mission, and you can listen uh, deeply uh, beyond all that clutter. I mean, that endless clutter when you wake up in the morning, C.S. Lewis talks about this, that you sort of, you, you wake up and you have like two seconds before it all rushes at you. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and who hasn't experienced what he's describing? I have, mm -hmm. I, I do every day. And so the challenge is to push that off enough that 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 little two seconds expands and you start to say you know let's 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 not just I mean, one of my fr friends once said it this way he said oh greg i'm too busy living to think about life if you're okay. too busy living to think about life you got a problem right like that the, you're just going to keep staying at a plateaued stage maybe even start to fail altogether you got to create some space to think and to see and to connect and to deeply listen to your life. The Quakers have a phrase I love. It's called, uh, it's called let your life speak. <laughs> mm. And so that's part of what I'm trying to do in the morning is to let that uh, other voice be heard to listen. Right. Uh, Socrates was known as the wisest man in the world, uh, you know, by some in his time. Mm. And he said, well, if I am, it's because I have a demon. <laughs> and this demon tells me what not to do. Uh, it never tells me what to do, but it tells me what not to do. Mm -hmm. And it's demon in a different way. We'd use that term now, but it's that inner voice, you know, that had a certain role for him. But I have found that if I create this space in that early hours, then, then I will, uh, that, then, and the more, the better, uh, then I will have a much better sense of what not to do, uh, what I should avoid today and avoid in my life and so on. Uh, I, I swim in the mornings. I'll go and do maybe I've limited myself to about 50 lengths. Um, I have started recently a practice of uh, language practice of while I'm swimming. Um, I will, I will listen to, uh, to a lesson of Spanish. My children are all bilingual and, uh, and I'm not, uh, but I slowly, steadily changing that. Um, when I come back from that, we'll normally have a sort of a family council, get everyone together, I have four children and they're all, um, teenagers now we're basically teenagers. And so we'll have a time together. We, we get into deep things in those conversations. It's not just, it's not just business for the day. It's, you know, it's, 
uh, it's 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 more wisdom literature it's scripture it's talking it's 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 uh, getting on the same page. Those have been very rich. We very, very rarely miss a day of that now. Um, sometimes we'll do it in a very low quality version, you know, uh, just sort of check, check mark. Okay, we did it. We've connected. We've had a moment together. Um, but, but often those have grown into something quite, quite substantial. Um, those, are some of the, those are some of the morning, uh, some of my morning routine. Right. And during the day, how do you manage your time? What tools, systems do you use? Um, well, one of the tools that I've found useful recently, uh, and of course there are other versions like this, but I found Asana quite useful. Uh, I don't know if you, have you used Asana? Is that yeah, yeah, I use Asana with? myself. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's not like it's a, it's not like it's a, some revolutionary answer to to offer that, but. But I have found it to be to be a very useful tool to be able to try and try and manage the the growing complexity. Um, yeah, most of us. Let, I'll say it the other way around. I'll say all of us have growing complexity in our lives, mm. and the longer we live, the more complex it becomes. And that's because responsibilities increase over time, and because every problem we face, we solve it, and we generally solve it and the unintended consequences that we've increased some form of social complexity, right? You have a problem and then you even, even, okay, you, you, you say, well, I'll hire someone to solve that problem. Well, you, 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 you take on a new project and then you have to find a way to put that into your schedule or uh, one day somebody buys a house. Okay. Well now you've got all of those different responsibilities and so on. So as responsibilities increase, complexity increases. And, and so you're, you have really only two things that you can do at that point. Um, and both are within the, the realm of what an essentialist does and is. Um, the first is to simplify, to choose to simplify proactively, not because you have to, but because you say, well, I'm just, these things no longer serve me anymore. So you're removing things from your life. You're removing things from your literal physical stuff uh, you know you, you're, you're removing things from the closet you're removing things from your your environment that distract you and actually bully you uh, you're doing the same for your calendar you're removing things that no longer uh, either are interest to you or you don't think are optimal you know contributions anymore so you're eliminating those things but the second thing that you can do is you build better systems uh, mm. that your systems are equal to the complexity uh, of your life and you know, whether it's Asana or some other so, so something else that, that helps to, to better get the stuff out of your head. Uh, I had David Allen on the What's Essential podcast, um, and, you know, he made this point. It's not unique on, in my interview with him, but he just said, you, you know, your, your, mind is, uh, your mind is amazing, but it's, it makes a bad office, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, yeah, if you... If you what tools, the right tools can do is they massively expand your capacity to handle complexity because you're not trying to keep it in the RAM of your brain. I mean, the RAM of your brain, the most recent research suggests that your brain can only handle about two things at one time, the RAM of your brain, before you start to become suboptimal. Mm -hmm. And for most of us, we have literally hundreds of things we're trying to keep there. And that just creates enormous uh, mental strain and fatigue and decision fatigue because we're just it's just not built for that uh, I mean compare it to what compare the kind of mental strain to and the to the agricultural age which represents like the majority of, uh, of human ex, you know of, of recorded human existence not that that was an easier time to be alive I'm not saying that but from a mental strain point of view, I mean, you're in nature all the time. You're repeatedly doing the task at hand. I mean, mm -hmm. you aren't getting texts and tweets. You aren't, you aren't having these. They're just the complexity was a completely different question, the mental complexity. So the society has advanced faster than our, our mental capacities. And so it creates this perpetual overload. Uh, so I, I, I just think, you know, you want to get, that's one tool that I have found useful um, it's, um, you know, it's not the only tool, but it's one that I've been using recently and found, found helpful. Right. So are you 
pretty much using that journal in the morning to figure out what to put on Asana. And then Asana determines what you actually do. Or are you deleting tasks from Asana as well, normally? Um, yeah. So, I mean, if, if we're going to go to the broadest, to the broadest system, systemic approach that I take, um, it, it goes, it's, those are just sort of two pieces of it. Uh, oh. the, the, the system, the system has, has a lot of um, well, some sophistication to it because, because I'm trying to make, um, I'm trying to make a disproportionate contribution in the world, right? And so you need systems that leverage your effort many times over. Yeah. Um, so um, among the things that I do, so every six months, uh, I'm doing a full, what I would call positive prioritization. Uh, process uh, where I'm reviewing the last six months and I'm identifying things I'm most grateful for. Mm. And that has a lot of advantages to it. Uh, the first is that, well, it feels good, right? It's, it's, it's a cathartic, satisfying experience to be able to just be grateful for all of these good things. But it's also... A, it's also a, a selection process because of all the different things you're saying, these are the things that mattered most. So it's actually quite a prioritization process without really meaning it to be. Mm. And so, and, it, and then another advantage is that because of you, I'm doing it in that way, it, you're identifying the things there's already some momentum with. So that's like, I will say page one, even though sometimes it's many pages that I'll, I'll fill out. Then the second page is, okay, well, given this as context, what, what are the next goals? What are the next most important things to do over the next six months? And often, not always, but often that's a continuation of the things that are already going well. And so you're building on something that already has momentum rather than just sort of randomly selecting things that you want to be on the list. So that that process is is hard to it's hard to overstate how important I think that part of the process is uh, because that's where that that just generates all those things I just mentioned. Uh, from there, I, I'm also monthly identifying the priority projects. Uh, there just can't be there can't be too many of them. Uh, there certainly certainly shouldn't be more than. I don't know, let's say, let's say not more than eight uh, projects. Even that feels high when I say it out loud. But these are projects that have a completion mm. possibility. So they're not ongoing. They're not an ongoing thing. So I wouldn't say, okay, swim this many times a week because that's part of the habit already. But I might say, introduce a new exercise, uh, you know, element to your, you know, in, it, 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 create a, uh, a, a plan uh, for running, uh, for, for participating in a sprint triathlon, right? That would be a project. Right. So you know it could be completed. And so that's, that's, you know, that's sort of step two. And you can use Asana for any of these, but you could use lots of tools for the same process. Mm. Um, you know, from there, then I'm doing the weekly review. Again, that's not unique in any way to me, but I'm, I'm looking through what am I grateful for from the week? What isn't working? A total honest review of that too, uh, you know, and and then and then looking at that week, just even the review, just not even changing anything, just reviewing it so that you're not uh, hit with each new thing as it happens reactively, which I think is a is a common experience in today's environment. Um, those are some of the additional sort of parts of the system. Uh, yeah, that I'm constructing sense. with, with w one more caveat, which is that I interviewed, um, I interviewed somebody recently, uh, uh, Rob Deerdeck, uh, who's uh, famous for being on M MTV uh, and, um, and a whole series of other things. I was blown away by my conversation with him. He he'd created a document that he sent me a 50 page document called the rhythm of experience. Um, I think that's what he called it. It was the most advanced uh, written plan 
that I've ever seen for mm. his life and his business. But mostly his life, just, you know, it connects to his business. And it was different because instead of it just being a list of sort of strategic goals and objectives and projects, it was, you know, that language, rhythm of experience. How do all these things fit together? And it went all the way down to the routine of his day. And it is, it has helped him to be so optimized in ways that are just totally fascinating to me. Uh, he has created systems upon systems upon systems. And, and maybe someone listening to this, maybe it all sounds overwhelming, but it's just helping him to go to the next level. Uh, let, me, let me share one, one more thought because it was so interesting to me. What happened is he, he'd successfully built a series of businesses. And a company comes along, an investment firm, and they say, look, we want to come and be partners with you. We want to write you a check, what he described as a life-changing number. And he said, okay, this is what I've been working for. This is fantastic. Let's do it. And they go and they evaluate his businesses and they come back and they say, um, uh, nope, we can't do it uh, because all of these businesses are really just you. Uh, you know, it's your force of will. It's your, um, your personality that's driving this, your tenacity. And, and they said, we would be willing to have a 50-50 arrangement where we just invest in you and 50% of everything you create in the future is ours or something or something. So he, he just says no to that deal. Uh, but he's so grateful. He said, he said, they named the problem and I hadn't realized that it was a problem up until that point. So he said, I want to start creating a, a, a company where I invest in other companies, right? I'm going to create an investment firm, mm -hmm. but I want to create a, a business that creates businesses and is, does it repeatedly. And he's doing, doing this. He's selling these businesses at $30 million each business. And they all, the whole system is running the system that's, that, that generates this. So, so it, it's, it's, you know, there's like, there's life before you discover, discover leverage systems and there's life after you discover them. And in the life before, you live in like a linear mindset where you say one I, you know, it's like I get paid if I work today, right? One ounce of effort equals one ounce of reward. And I would say for majority of people, even successful people, they don't really get past that. Mm. You know, they get paid more for their ounce of effort, but they're still just getting and paid in this inverted commas. It's just results, right? It could be a variety of results, not just financial results, but, but it's the effort and reward are linearly related. You right. put in more effort, you get more reward. Well, that's fine. In fact, perfectly mm -hmm. reasonable and good if someone isn't putting in any effort. Start putting in effort, get results. Start being smarter and more efficient in the effort you put in, you'll get better results. Great. But what about the people listening to this who, are, who want to have 10x results? Mm. Not one of them can work 10x harder. Yeah. But what do you do? Then you have to get not just ROI, return on investment, but ROE, you want return on effort. And that means you have to find high leverage systems to be able to get results for you. I'll give you one more example. Uh, this is a friend of mine, Jessica, uh, Jessica Jakeley, who was interested in making a big 10x contribution in the world. She goes to, to she's in Africa with her then husband and other people, and they're trying to see how they can help people who are subsistence level entrepreneurs and and she finds one and says, well, listen, how can we help you? Now, this person is, is, is an extreme example of what I just talked about, linear results. And it's very understandable why. Uh, she's got, she, she's, she's selling produce on the street. Um, if she doesn't sell produce today, she doesn't earn you know, very, very little money, but she doesn't earn that money to be able to have food for her her children and for her to eat. So it, that is literally every single day she must be there because if she doesn't, they don't eat. Mm. So Jessica comes along and says, well, look, what would help you? How could we create a system? You know, what would it take? So you could take some time out and, and build a, a slightly different business model for you or, or, or change. And she said, well, I know what I would do. Uh, if I could take off enough time, I would go and negotiate with 
all the providers of this produce to be able to get it distributed directly to me instead of through the middleman that takes you know off any possible profits for me but it would take some time to do it and well, what's the what, how how much would it take to do all this and set it up well five hundred dollars which is in a developed country rate five hundred dollars just doesn't sound very much for what you're describing as a total change of your business and so they're, they're just about to like go okay well we're going to just give five hundred dollars let's get this going and then they think and it's like this is part the part of the story gets so cool it's like well that's one form of leverage we help this person one time and then they think well well, what if it was a loan? Okay, that helps her and it also would then help somebody else in perpetuity. So that would be great. And then they think, well, if we're going to do that, what if we could get other people like us? We're not the only people. What if we what if, what if we created a little platform, like a website, so other people from all over the world could that are interested in like us giving $500 or $100 or a small micro loan to somebody? And, and then that would be reinvested. And that was the birth of Kiva.org. So now where are we at a few years later on is that you could have had $500 contribution uh, one time. That's, that was sort of first option. They've had instead $1.3 billion worth of investments wow. made and 97% of those are, are repaid. So it's going to be in perpetuity still. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, that's yeah. the before and after. That's what Rob Deerdeck is applying in his life in various ways. And it's so you know, impressive mm -hmm. to me. And it, it, you know, told me, showed me that there were many more layers for me to be able to adapt these ideas myself. And, and you can see in a social innovation way as well. It's if as soon as you start to think in terms of leverage, in terms of, in terms of, yeah, what I would call like effortless results, hmm. build systems that, that, that create results for you rather than just creating the results directly yourself. That's the shift. And, and I'm trying to do it right now. I just partially because of all of this, um, I just launched an academy at essentialism.com, right? I mean, it's a bit of a pitch to say it right now, but it's to illustrate too. You know, previously, you know, I could teach, uh, teach one time and then you make the impact. And suddenly I'm like, well, that's so limited. I've yeah. got to teach in such a way where I create something that's even better than my typical teaching experience but can be scaled forever and ever. And people can have it 10 years from now and 20 years from now. And so, so that we're, we're in like, I'd say phase two of a 10 phase process uh, to be able to just create the best learning experience for people to, to, to figure out what's essential and make it more effortless to do it in their lives. Yeah. Makes so much sense. I, li I like what you said, return on effort and just finding those leverages. And so that way we can essentially achieve more with less effort. So, Firstly, Greg, I just want to say uh, thank you for all the gems and wisdom. I mean, oh my, I, I feel like I've been hosed in the face. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry about that. That doesn't, that doesn't seem quite right, but... <laughs> no, no, but it's, it's awesome. It's truly awesome. Um, I suppose the final question, just to wrap up, um, if you were to just leave all the listeners with just one bit of reminder that you want us to all remi remember from the last 60 minutes or so, what would that important message be? I came across a very touching story in writing Effortless, and it didn't make it into the final book, uh, but it's sort of my one regret that it didn't. Um, it was a story of a mother who was with her dying son, the end of his life, uh, in the hospital, and she knows it's the end. She knows this is it, um, because there is a time sometimes, and I've had it, I've been with people in this moment where they're not fully here still, but they're not fully there yet. And it's in that in-between. And in the in-between, he, he suddenly opens his eyes and he, he says to his mother, it's all so simple. Mom, it's all so simple. And those were his last words that he died. And from that, I think we can draw one final question for today's conversation, which is just to ask, how am I making, how am I making life more how am I making life harder than it needs to be? And as soon as we have that, we have something with which to begin. You know, let's just start with that. Uh, that to me would be the final thought, final question, and an easy place to start. <laughs>